Так. Yeah, because the question still need to be answered, regardless of its simplicity. Yes, because not everybody knows everything that they should. <coughs> Chuck. Is this thing on? Hello? Hi, this is live. Hello? It, it, the, the, the light is on. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hello. Sing us an aria. <laughs> okay, you're confusing me with the other slightly round guy who actually runs this thing. You don't want to hear me sing. It's, 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 uh, it's worse than feedback. No, no, you really don't. It's, it's awful. Um, worse is hearing me rap, and no, I won't do that either. What up, T? Yeah, word, bite, nibble. Um, anyway, shall we? Yeah, are, are, are we, we ready to go? Okay. 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 So this will be the telecommunications question and answer panel. I'm Paul. Um, this is Mike. He spent how many years at a CLEC, in various CLECs? 14 between CLECs and long distance careers. Yeah, and um, he's a PBX tech. I'm Nick, I'm a PBX tech for an unnamed government entity. <laughs> DMV. <laughs> this is the man who screws up and photoshops your driver's license photo. Irrelevant. <laughs> Uh, I'm Joe, um, general telecommunications and, and data bitch for various companies. Drop the B word, nice. Yeah. <laughs> I'm tired. Me too. So. Anyhow, I work at a uh, competitive local exchange carrier. I run a website called telcodata.us that um, you can look up various information about numbers, switches, things like that. And um, over the years, I've gotten a bunch of identical questions from people and um, and a lot of them just simply demonstrate that there's not enough training in the industry. No one really knows. Uh, they'll ask me either something simplistic or something that is completely irrelevant to telecommunications or they'll be just simply asking the question wrong and I won't understand what they're trying to say. And so last year we had a fill-in speech for someone who didn't show and um, it went really well. And so this year, we actually have it on the schedule and people show. So the idea is to try and take questions from the audience. And um, you have a panel of experts here that probably collectively have uh, <laughs> three quarters of a century of experience um, between data, telephone, and PBX, and anything else. So if you ever had a question, now's the time to ask it. Um, does anyone here want to start with a question? Okay. No, it's fine. I'll just yell. Well, no, we did for the tape. That's yeah. true. So for now, stand over there. We're going to try to get another okay. suggestion. That's fine. So <laughs> that's all right. For under okay. ten. We'll just do the three tenors. That could be kind of painful. Yeah, I guess it's the same yeah. thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if no one has any questions, I'm just going to start going on about the divestiture, and you don't want that. I guess I have a question. It's for you, Paul. Okay. Um, where do you get all the information for telco data? Oh, I answered this one last year. Um, I wasn't here, sorry. <laughs> it's cool. Um, the North American Numbering Plan Administrator provides a great deal of it. Um, they're a publicly regulated body, I believe. Federally, yes. Yeah, something weird like that. And um, they're required to publish certain amounts of that data as to who is assigned a certain number block, what switch it's going to. Um, and then the other thing is that uh, CLEX and ILEX are required to publish certain amounts of their data.
Um, like if they're going to make a switch change, they have to say, we're going to change this silly code. Um, it's like a DMS 100. We're going to change it to a Siemens EWSD with this silly code on this date. And so I just look at that and go, oh, well, that silly code's an e a DMS 100, and that one's an EWSD. Now I know. And um, there's a lot of things like that. Like Verizon has an equal access site that says which switches are capable of um, you know, pre-subscribing to a long distance carrier. And in there, they include things like the switch type and everything else. So <clears throat> with that, I've been able to kind of put all that data together in a database and publish it on a website. Any other questions? I got a two-part question for you, so to speak. Um, I've recently been interested in exploring the world of Asterix, um, and I was wondering if you could give an overview on that, as well as, in your opinion, uh, perhaps what the best live version of um, uh, PBX software would be. Um, does anyone here actually uh, By deal live, with I mean that can run from a CD, for example. Right. Does anyone ever here actually use the live version? Uh, I have used Trixbox for a few things, um, which is one of the, the only one I've actually played with so sure. far. And between that, I mean, it gives you this really nice canned little distribution to play with, and it's got all the website stuff, and it says, hey, I'm going to throw this in, install it to your hard drive, or just run it off the CD, and then you can go in and, and manage things off the web interface. The, the problem is, is that it's their conception, and it's how they say, okay, we're going to set up everything for you and, and take care of it. You can just go through it in the web interface, which if that's as far as you want to go, that's fine. If you really want to get down into learning it, though, I um, mean, go into your favorite distro, either check it out from SVN or just install it because, like, it's in, it's in Debian. There's a recent yeah. distribution of Debian test. You can just app it. Yeah, you can app get it or you can add it from, from CentOS or, or Fedora or whatever. And I, it, even I, I'm, like, a huge Debian zealot, but I still compile it. It's the one thing I ever compile. Yeah, and, and he doesn't like compiling anything. So, yeah. um, but if you really want to learn how it works, if you really want to get into the nuts and bolts, or if you find like a situation, it's like, well, I need to configure this, but they didn't give me this option in the web interface. You're going to find yourself getting very frustrated with it. Um, so my suggestion is, is like, you know, if if you don't necessarily have another system to run it on, or if you don't want to mess with the current system, well, go get VMware Player, throw a Linux Player image on it, go get VMware Server, run it in there, just for test purposes with the internal. Uh, loopback stuff, it works fine just for VoIP. And, um, yeah, and, and that would work too, but my, my, my overriding point was that um, sometimes web interfaces prevent you from really starting to know how it, what it can do and what it's capable of doing. Right. And I have a customer, for example, who uses Trixbox and they swear by it. The thing is, is that when they set up a SIP trunk with me, they, uh, they had like two different peer entries. And I'm going, I, I just use friend. And they're like, my interface doesn't Ooh, support that. I'm like, well, if I use friend, it all matches. And so he's like got this weird mismatch problem where some of it's in band and some of it's uh, our AVT, RFC 2833 touch tones. And I've been fighting with him back and forth to try and get touch tones to properly on a system for like ages. But in the end, I just SSH to his machine edited his SIP config file and put that in there and it was done. So, you know, it, it seems to be the most popular thing. It works for a number of people, but um, there is a lot of problems with either using web, or the other thing is that he couldn't upgrade it. Um, you know, when you're doing something like running a general purpose OS, you can just upgrade the OS. But when you're using something like Trixbox, it's got its own weird dependencies and it doesn't sometimes install over itself properly. Um, and this is all, I have never done it, but this is what I've been told. And so, you know, he can't upgrade it at asterisk 1.4 without completely wiping it out and starting again, is what he says. Doesn't mean he's necessarily clueful about it, but I'm going to take him at his word. <coughs> I've got some stuff in the hat, so awesome. I, I believe I believe this is the, I believe this one's for you. Are you wearing underwear? Does it have Pikachu on it? I am indeed wearing underwear, and it is I'm blue. No Pikachu. <laughs> Aren't you glad you asked? Should I switch from cable internet service to DSL? That would really depend on where you live. 
<laughs> or work or whatever. I mean, my office is in Farmington Hills, Michigan. We can we have DSL or you know, cable service from Bright House, which is horrible. Um, if they're equal, you know, I guess you go on price. I mean, as long as it works. But in some areas, you have uh, cable service that's less than that's that's crappy, and some areas you have DSL that's crappy, or both. It really depends on where you live. And something I want to add to that, um, from my experience, it's been that in many cases DSO will end up cheaper than the cable, but if you count in, you're right over there. If you count in perhaps bundling it in with your voice service, a lot of times I've been able to get service like T1 PRI bundled with their data service for maybe $20 more than what I would pay for regular analog phone lines and a uh, DSL circuit. So that's also something to keep in mind. Basically, find the best thing to do the job at the best price that you can. And you can also create your own best deals by doing what I do with Comcast. Like in my area, both services are equally good. Um, every few months, my wife calls Comcast and says, why should I stick with you guys when I can get DSL for twelve ninety five a month. Now she knows the difference between the two services, but the clueless call center person doesn't. So suddenly our forty four ninety five gets knocked down to twenty ninety five for the next six months or whatever. You know, you can make your own deals too. I haven't paid a sprint bill for the past three months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you, if you know how to argue with them, yeah, it was one of my points last night. You could get a lot of stuff for free. The other thing with the DSL is, is that if you're looking at hosting your own services, a lot of the DSL providers are a lot friendlier in this regard. They don't filter 25 at the dev edge device. They don't filter uh, port 80, you know, um, that sort of thing. So if you're looking for somebody that, that did this, I would say, hey, go look at Speakeasy, but they just got bought by Best Buy, and we all know what happened to Geek Squad. <laughs> um, Any recommendations on other DSL carriers? Um, it depends on where you live. Um, disclosure, I'm a sales agent for the like, C-Luck he works for. Um, find, and actually that's not a bad point. If you can find a local reseller of service, because a lot of times what happens in the case of, of the C-Luck Paul works for, they actually are, are riding on SBC's lines, but all the back end stuff is their services which means that it's all Ameritech's infrastructure, AT&T's infrastructure. They've been doing this long enough through the buyouts that I, I will use all three interchangeably. Um, find a smaller provider that's doing something like that that has a good rep. Um, usually they'll work with you and they'll be a lot more clueful about doing stuff because there's usually one or two guys in the back end who are doing the support, the configuration, and the deployment of everything. And um, as long as you're not making their lives hell, um, a lot of times, which is a good thing, you know, occasionally send them thank you emails for, for service because the more you piss them off, all of a sudden stuff stops working. <laughs> um, or when it breaks, they may be less apt to go fight another fire or not that, but it's another ramp. Yeah. But uh, that's, that's the like big advantage. If event. he's going to yell at me either way, why, why would I make it a priority? Yeah, something like that. So if, you know, find a local provider. I don't, you know, Speakeasy used to be who I recommended everybody, but again, they've just been acquired. Um, because they, they actually, for nationally, they were amazingly clueful for what they did, for the price you paid. Um, the cable internet service, you know, if you're on Wide Open West, you're actually doing fairly good because the support's not bad, but, you know, Comcast, well, <laughs> they, speak, they speak or do not speak for themselves, as, as it were. And a provider, the same provider in one area <clears throat> can be great, and you go five miles across town and it completely sucks. Exactly. I've seen plenty of cases where, you know, a customer is really great with Comcast in one area. In another place, they're taking their 6 meg DSL out and replacing it with one of our T1s. They just can't deal with it. And in one case, it was actually in a variety, er, there was a Comcast office in the building. And they couldn't, they couldn't have a reliable telephone <coughs> service. So they just That's switched to a T1. Comcastic. <laughs> well, uh, that's, 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 yeah, that is Comcastic. Also, if you talk to the installers that come out, you tell them you're in the industry and stuff, they start to talk. And they start to be really honest with you, too. Yeah, actually, the more, that actually kind of goes and segues into a, a different digression and, and a point I actually wanted to make last night and didn't, is um, when you get the installers out there and, and anybody who attended the secrets of, of, of the dead drone guy, um, they're invisible. People don't talk to them. They just let them in and they do their thing. A lot of times, 
they're kind of lonely in a way. If you talk to them and ask them questions, they will talk your ear off. You can get all sorts of information about the stuff coming into your building, out of your building, to your house, or, or whatever, and, and say, hey, so what's that cross box over there doing? A lot of them are like us. Yeah, they, they, will, they will talk your ear off and they will not shut up. Um, so you can, you can usually get all sorts of information without doing much social engineering at all. I wasn't even meaning by the social engineering standpoint either. Just, well, no, I know. I was just, just saying you're interested kind of digressing like, off. But they're like, hey, there's a head end behind your fence over there. I'm like, really? You know? Exactly. And they, they, you, know, you find out all kinds of interesting things from that standpoint. And that, that can help your decision too. I think this one's for you because you're in sales. What's the actual cost of services like voicemail, SMS, and long distance? Therefore, does the markup on those prices? This is this is actually maybe a better question for Paul, but but based on I can't talk about that at all. Yeah, actually, he can't. I I can to an extent because I've researched it on my own, wanting to look into actually becoming a VoIP provider, and decided it was easier to resell somebody else's services. Um, if you go onto a site like um, <clears throat> HTTPS or HTTPS .com, which is publicly available through Google, so I'm not going to get into trouble for mentioning it, there are spreadsheets, if you search in there, that will tell you what they sell to CLEX and, and the pricing they will do for that, the flat rate pricing. And when you look at that versus what you get charged, actually get charged for T1, um, you start looking at becoming your own phone company. Um, the, the, the differences are kind of staggering in terms of what you get for pricing. Um, SMS, for example, is compared to what the voice channel services cost, you know, what they're charging you, like 15 cents a message on Sprint, for example, if you're not paying for it, is absolutely ludicrous. Um, Especially since a lot of it is bill and keep. Exactly. Well, they have their expenses too, they have gateways. And well, yeah, I mean, providers. there's, I mean, that's the other thing is that it's, you can look at a pricing and you can see, oh, well, this is what the CLEC is paying for it. But you do have to take into effect that there are people who are hired to make sure that that works all the time. There are people who are hired to make sure your bills are accurate and sent to you. There are people who are hired to process your payments. There are people who are hired to go, in, to, go to bat for you with the ILEC and try to get your phone lines working because uh, it's really not as easy as you think sometimes. They'll come up with a million excuses why they can't do something instead of just fixing the problem. They'll be like, oh, well, you know, we said we could put a T1 here, but we don't have facilities anymore. You used the last good pair you were on just went dead, so we're going to shut the T1 off. And you go, oh, no, you're not. And so, I mean, you know, you, if you're going to become your own phone company just to save 20 bucks, I mean, that's not only retarded, but... Um, <laughs> Well, it's not that easy. I mean, yeah, well, no, not the anymore. Right? You go to the regulatory sections of the of AT and T, and it's it's all there what people pay. You say, okay, they're paying two point two cents a minute to terminate calls. I think is what some C likes that I work for. Yeah. And then you think, well, oh, well, I'll mark it up to five cents. Well, you have billing and all kinds of costs that add up, and suddenly, you know, it's not the point two cents. It's the the billing. It's the you run a T1 to somebody and SBC has to run new facilities and they hand you a bill for $5,000 because they have to run a wire across the street and rip up sidewalks. And suddenly, being a CLAC maybe isn't so, maybe isn't as attractive. Yeah, I, I, was, I was speaking semi-facetiously. It, it does put the, when you, when you see the price initially, it does kind of put that idea into your head. But no, it isn't as easy as, as you might think. And, and, and Paul's absolutely right. And it's right. very easy to do wrong. Um, <clears throat> and it's no secret that telecom billing is some of the worst things you can ever get involved with. Because in most industries, you know, you, you're selling a product and it has a fixed price. Mm -hmm. But with telecom, people expect to be able to negotiate everything. So, oh yeah, your circuit's actually going to be like $50 cheaper um, <coughs> for these three sites on your bill. And then, you know, at those sites, we're also going to give you like, you know, two cents off a minute. And, but at the same time, these three people were here before we upped the prices. And so they are grandfathered under an old plan we don't even support anymore. And so they'll continue to be billed at this rate while the new plan takes effect for new customers and bills them at this rate. Yeah, and this doesn't even get into fun things like Recip Comp, where, you know, if I send calls at a, at a, at a, at a carrier, you know, I'm paying them to terminate the call if I'm, a, if I'm a carrier. When they call me, I'm being, they're paying me basically to terminate the call at my customer. Okay, the you're billing the them. Yeah, so there's a, well, at the end of the month, you settle up and basically money goes in both directions right. and somebody comes yeah. out ahead and somebody comes out Actually, behind. And there's a hidden back end billing that's, that's entirely based off of Yeah, that. and money's supposed to go, but um, the ILACs aren't really good at doing that. You think about Recep Comp and you think, well, I've got all this money rolling in. No, you don't. 
you send them, you send the I like a bill. They say, we didn't send this, you know, they, they say, no, you didn't, we didn't send you this many minutes. And they will, you know, stall you for 12 months. Yeah, and you have to go, well, here's the call detail records. You definitely sent these out this truck. To which you say, like, well, why don't you sue them? That, which is a really wonderful idea. You know, yeah. Go ahead and sue them. Yeah, the, go, go ahead and sue Basically, one of the largest would, companies they, in they the world. They pay you when they want, when they want. And yeah. that's the reality of it. And so. if you put that with the fact that nobody really likes the phone company anyway. You know, in general, I don't think people <coughs> like their phone company. I, I think since for a very long time, I don't think anybody has. It's, it's why the competitive carriers are actually doing business. If people liked the bells, they wouldn't be in business. Um, so. Can we get a mic? Hold on. So you have all these independent carriers and you guys have to trade calls with each other. Could you give like a brief overview of how you decide how to route calls? Is it still centralized, or is there some kind of like phone routing protocol, kind of like BGP? Um, okay, this gets really complex. Um, basically, <laughs> um, for the most part, you look at a site like Telco Data, and it seems pretty straightforward. You go, oh, well, this, this prefix and this area code are to this carrier. And it used to be that's all you needed. Mm -hmm. um, you could get it from the LURG, you could get it from I mean, I, don't, I tell people, you know, don't use it for routing, but plenty of people do use my data for that, myself included, because um, uh, why pay for it? <laughs> I already have it. It's a fortune, too, to learn. Oh, yeah. It's, I've seen quotes as high as $45,000. You pay per month some insane amount. And one, I've been before, for years before I met Paul, I was using the site for years to do all my routing and stuff, and I'm like, huh, it's free. You, you might want to explain what the, what the LURG database actually is. Yeah, basically the LURG database says for this area code and this prefix, route it to this carrier, possibly on this switch or this trunk group. How do you, how do you know like, how to get there? Um, you basically just have to keep digging to figure out, well, where is this switch? Who runs it? And then how do I connect to it? So or you, you pass it off at the tandem. Yeah, so right. How do the tandems work? Yeah. It, yeah. A lot of it changes too. If you send a call to the carrier one day, the next day it becomes cheaper or more expensive. You could be changing routes every day. Uh, yeah, depending on what time of the month it is and who, how many minutes you've already sent. A lot of it is if you've only got two or three upstream carriers, um, depending on where the call is going, like if you've got a long distance exchange carrier and all of your out of state calls, for example, okay, fine, dump, dump to this carrier that I've got a, a, a T12 or now they're even doing uh, voice over IP trunking for, for long distance uh, exchange. Um, but anything in state, okay, I've got a connection up to the local tandem switching office, which is where everything's theoretically supposed to terminate and then gets routed out by the phone company there. And I'm just going to signal up that link saying, hey, this is where that call is going. Um, when that call goes down, or if let's say that link goes down, I can say, okay, fine, that link's failed, kind of like BGP, and just dump all my traffic over to that long distance link. It'll cost me more, but my service is still up. Right. And when, it get, when you get into LNP, it even gets more complicated. Yeah, unfortunately. There's, there's an LNP database that you pay to look up and you basically send it a phone number, and it either sends you back an identical phone number, meaning that it's not ported, or it will send you back what's called a learned routing number, or LRN. And you take, how you, what you do is you look at the LRN and say, I route the call as if it was going to this number. But you still send the original number on the trunk. You just use the trunk routing that you have set up for that LRN. If you don't build your switch router, you can be sending uh, you know, like a Cavalier ported number to SBC and drive yourself. Or yeah. The same going, why isn't it working? Or, or even worse, worse you, you get a big bill at the end of the month because they tra they build you for tandem transport. Yeah, there, yeah. there are companies that make software that do nothing but crunch this data based on the input parameters you give it and spit back the routes, even optimizing down to the second as to when it's doing it, depending on capacity at the time. Um, LNP really kind of screwed things up for a lot of things, you know, with the you know, they were, some of you recall when they, they announced that the cellular portability was going to take effect soon, and then that got, del got delayed a couple of times, as I recall correctly. Yeah, because the ILEX freaked out, and they're like, oh my god, we'll have to LNP dip everything now. Yeah, because it is extremely complex to do. Um, 
you know, the phone network was never really built to do it. Um, right. All of this stuff is hacks on hacks on hacks and layers on layers. If you, if you ever start sifting down through how 911 trunks work, um, they haven't changed too much, for example, as a technical thing. You're like, my God, my, my, my heart attack call is going to go over this antiquated piece of shit. But it still works. That's the thing. It, they don't change it much because it still works. And you realize that the rest of the network and is, most of them still use the same MF signaling that was victim to the blue box. Yeah, like you look it's at just it, on you private say, links. You say, what the hell are they using this for? Because it works. <laughs> because it works. If your SS7 link goes down, you're screwed. But on these trunks, you, know, you want to be able to dial 911 and have it work every time. Exactly. And not have it fail because <clears throat> someone put a comma somewhere and you know, brought the SS7 link down. So there's a lot of things to consider. Legible. Yeah, I'm just trying to read through it. Oh yeah. <clears throat> Are there any legitimate uses for nine seven six numbers? I can take that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have a friend of mine. She is quite scary looking, but she started a business based out of her house, and it has a 976 number. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I installed the phone system in her house. She actually has a call queue where people pay 275 a minute to wait for her to give them hot talk on a local number. So I'm guessing um, that people are willing to pay the 976 rate plus any additional toll rates for hot talk. <laughs> Which, you know, it, I, I'm a bit of a capitalist. My thing is, is that, hey, if you want to spend money on that, it's a legitimate business. Nobody's telling you to pick up the phone and dial with exactly. one hand. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, if you manage to do it, you must have really wanted to. Or speed to. dial, whatever. But. 610976. Yeah. <laughs> really what, my, what my question was entailing is, are, are there any area codes that do not use 976 for calls uh, that would oh, you're basically be saying, by business. So what you're basically asking is, is like, hey, if I ordered a business line or a home phone line, would I get a 976 prefix to it? Well, well more like if I'm configuring a, a corporate PBX system, do I want a blanket block 976, or are there any? Yes. Uh, pretty yes, much definitely. that and 900 and, and all of those, that's, that's why they were established. Uh, 298's the other one for, or at least in, in Michigan, for radio stations. Uh, well, for that's... That's just in 313. Like, uh, oh, that's just in 313. Yeah, 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 like radio right. station choke trucks. Well, the, th this question actually deals with, um, with the... Uh, Generally, you want to block it. Because yeah. it's, it's either a lottery it's or dial a bank or, you know, something that you're not going to do with the office yeah. unless you're... <coughs> and you know, the other thing... Is, whatever, but generally you're not going to be using those services. And the other so thing you should know is that it. the FCC requires that phone companies be able to block that for a customer on request for free. So you don't necessarily even have to configure the PBX. Just call your phone company and say, I want 900-976 block on every line. I'd still put it in there because, <laughs> frankly, do you trust the phone company to do it properly? <laughs> Speaking from a phone company, still. Yeah, you, um, it's, it's, they still do it, but a lot of times you get calls, like working at Celex, we would get calls after. Can you uh, block 976 numbers? And you look at their, their bill, and some employee had been staying late. You know, to, there's nobody here after five, yet there all these calls at 10 o'clock, and you know, <laughs> the janitors in the back were, you know, running up the phone bill. And, you know, they asked for the black men. Actually, that does up a, bring up a point that if somebody starts beige boxing you and they're at the, if you've got analog pairs and they're throwing a butt side on at the cross and dialing all of these 900, 976 and international calls, sometimes it pays to actually have that stuff blocked. Um, this is another good reason that if you get to enough phone lines, not only does the cost go up, but if you go switch to a PRI, this becomes a lot harder to do. Right. Right. And um, you're responsible. It's your bill. Right. And That's the worst part about it. And you can tell it, basically, if it's 976 numbers, you can tell them to get bent, and you, they may send collections after you, so what, but international calls will follow you. <laughs> I mean, that, that's a more complicated situation. If there's anything you're not sure of, block it. Right, and one thing that I tend to do whenever I do an install of PBX myself um, is that whenever consulting with the customer, the immediate thing is 900 and 976 are blocked from the telco. 
I've had one situation, only one situation where they've actually asked me to enable it. And it was actually at a school district. Oh, that's frightening. <laughs> Yeah, why? What was it for? I don't want to know. I didn't ask. I didn't question it. Somebody <laughs> told me paying. not to ask certain questions. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. So what was OK. Um, this goes into your 313-298. Yeah, the choke trumps. Right, the choke tandems. Uh, sometimes when you are listening to the radio stations, to get to be caller 10, you get a prize. I have heard of people breaking the line to be caller 10. How is this done? Well, I'm not going to tell you, but. Also, where's the best place to call a station from? Is it, is it the local switch or what? What happens is, you'll notice if you listen to the radio, almost everyone, all your stations in the same area have the same prefix. Even if they're not physically located in the area code, such as um, like uh, TV2 in Detroit is well within the borders of 248, but has 313, 298, something. And you go, what? That's downtown. They're not even anywhere near it. What, what there is, is 313-298 routes to a special switch that doesn't use SS7 and just uses MF trunks. And every, every CO is supposed to have lines pulled to that. And the, the problem is, is when you do that and say, hey, the first, the tenth caller to this line is going to win like a million dollars. Thousands of people pick up the phone and hit redial. And um, you need some way to have the entire phone network not fall apart when that happens. And so what they do is they simply provide T1s that go completely separate, non-SS7 trunks, they don't go through tandems, things like that, so that when these lines get the crap blasted out of them, it doesn't affect normal telephone service. It just busies out when they get full. Right, and you, what'll happen is if you keep hitting redial, you'll see all kinds of weird errors. Sometimes you'll see them go to dead air. Sometimes it'll take 10 minutes to ring. Sometimes it'll just ring endlessly. More than likely, it didn't go through. Only a small percentage of the calls will actually complete because there are so many people listening to the station hitting, hitting redial, especially with things like PBXs and PRIs these days. You can outpulse the number in under a, t under a tenth of a second. So, you know, if, imagine if everyone had a speed dial button on their PBX, um, they just boom at the exact moment they say that, it will just completely crush the choke switch. But that's what it's for. And um, honestly, if I were to be doing it, where I would want to be is on a POTS line served from the choke switch. Because yep. the problem you're going to run into is there's only a couple of T1s from every CO going there. And once they're full, your call can't go through. But if you're on the choke switch, you're limited only by the back plane of the system. And so, you know, you really want to be right there. You, you make it past the first round of, of triage then. Correct. And if, if you want to know what the other side is like, um, I went to Central Michigan University for a while. And this, back in the early 90s, they introduced wonderful touch tone registration. And it was the first semester we ever had. And we were served up a DMS 100 that the university had. So of course, the word goes out, register for your classes, and we all pick up our phones and start hitting a redial. What happens is um, you have to wait for a dial tone because everyone's picking up their phone at the same time. And, and there's only so many dial tone but it generators. But even better. We, we brought down not only our switch, but Mount Pleasant and the Alma tandem. Well done. <laughs> because people would, wow. call, people would call from home, people, you know, have, have their parents call, whatever. And, you know, if you don't plan mass calling like that, some really cool, interesting things can happen. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you're dialing 911 or something, you know, it's not funny anymore. But, you know, we, I'd have to wait, you know, five minutes for a dial tone. It's the only time I've ever had that happen. And there's, you know, meetings between phone companies. And Apparently you don't live in Verizon territory. It was Verizon territory. <laughs> oh, okay. <All> right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Actually, even worse, GTE, ex-GTE Verizon GTE. territory, which they, they're uh, not exactly known for stable. And on another thing with mass calling, um, to get on the subject of things like American Idol that use the 866 numbers, um, what they're actually doing and the reason that they're using toll-free instead of going, ha, let's do 900 and charge them or some sort of local number, is that with 800, you can do things like um, you can route calls from a specific NPA NXX to a specific uh, tandem uh, kit code. You can, route, you can route calls based on LATA. 
you can route calls based on the state they come from. And so you can globally redistribute all of your call taking all over the place. So there's not one central area. So if you're getting like a billion calls from California, like, oh, dude, I like Sanjay or whatever. Oh, my god. Um, they're probably not even leaving the state of California. They may not even be leaving your LATA. It goes down to the exchange level. Well, you know, when, yeah. when, when it looks up, because anytime an, an 866 number get, or a toll-free number gets looked up, it, it gets uh, digits in, in a switch pointed at it saying, hey, this is the phone number this 866 is actually pointed to. What a lot of people actually don't know. No, it's not true anymore. No. Oh, um, wow. Because well, it used to be, it used to be it was pointed at a POTS line. It's pointed to a LD carrier who then translates it to a POTS if they choose. Okay, yeah. But before yeah. that, they, they do the SMS lookup. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of the routing goes. Like, depending right, because you can dynamic, because you can see where it's coming from. It'll go down to the exchange, so if a bunch of people in my area want to call Sanjay, you know, it'll go down, you know, have five, six carriers to send it to based on the exchanges. Oh, yeah, okay. So that we can all vote for our favorite titles. And the it's other thing, that's the other thing I get a lot of questions about. How do I find out where a toll free number is pointing? Don't even ask. Um, basically, your toll free number is pointing at a long distance carrier. And that's all the databases that normal people have access to tell you. Inside the long distance carrier, they have their own routing tables that could be deciding a number of things. They could say, send the first five calls here, send the next 10 calls here, and then send 25% of the remainder here, unless it's after 7 PM, at which case, you send it down this dedicated T1 trunk. Though a lot of people, like they'll inherit, and this is something I run into a lot, have actually doing orders where we're reporting over a, a 866 number to the carrier, and we sometimes need to find out who originally had it when I set up the paperwork. Um, if you Google for uh, Resborg ID lookup, there is actually a number run by AT&T. It is a toll-free number, ironically, that you can call and punch in the toll-free number, and it will tell you an, uh, um, the ID of the company, and if it's in their database, it'll tell you the name. Yeah, and it will tell you the trouble reporting number. Yeah, it'll also tell you the trouble reporting it's number. It's under Ameritech Rest Board ID. Yeah. yeah. I'm the sorry, responsible organization for the, the number. Um, who, who, actually, who actually decides where this call's going to if somebody dials it? Yeah, toll free is kind of weird. They have something called the SMS that's a main database. It has nothing to do with short message, by the way. And um, you can become a responsible organization for a number. And then when you do that, you are responsible for updating the entries in the SMS. Now, typically, a customer can be a REST board. They usually aren't. But if you run into somebody like IBM, they probably run their own REST board because it'll save them some dough and let them have a lot more control because they can control directly where the number routes. Well, yeah, this is, this is how call center routing is, is done as well. Um, when you call like, you know, 1-800 or 866 for one now or Comcast or something, and you know, your first call when you call them is in, is in Canada, the second one's in India, the third one's in wherever. A lot of times this is how they're doing that, and they can control that. So if a call center goes down, they can just immediately flip it rather than having to call their carrier, have the carrier update it, and a couple hours later, they're finally back on. Right, and the rest org is not always the carrier. A lot of people use their carrier as the rest org, but it is possible to have several carriers that are pointed to by a single rest org. So you can say, hey, rest org, when someone calls from here, send them to this carrier because it's cheaper from this slata. Uh, otherwise, send them to this carrier. And they will go into the database and add that entry. And if there's a problem, the rest org is the one responsible for the errors. And so the REST Borg has trained people that are only doing SMS, that know what they're doing. They have 24-hour requirements. Mm -hmm. that somebody has to be available to fix it because you can't just go around breaking the 800 number database for your own. For fun and profit. Yeah, for fun and profit. ATL communications is one that I've used in the past. Right. Because There's a it, the routing gets so complicated that sometimes it's easier just to say, send all the calls here because it gets so detailed that we really don't want the hassle. Right. I was just going to say, we've, got a, we've had this question. And this, it's actually kind of an interesting one because it gets into, a little bit into the, what you can do hacking-wise. Um, would you suggest that a home asterisk experimenter get an ISDN BRI, uh, basic rate interfaces, for purposes of messing with the D channel, or can all the fun be had with an internet termination provider? Um, I, what I'm going to start off by saying is, is try ordering an ISDN BRI these days. Um, <laughs> I've tried recently. It's not easy. Um, you can theoretically still get one. They make a living hell to do so. They don't want you ordering them. Right. They're non-tariffed in Michigan. They're non-tariffed in Michigan, and, for example. And um, 
I'm sorry? Not being interrupted, $228 a month for a BRI. Yeah, and they're also kind of pricey. For that price, for a couple hundred dollars more, you could probably have a PRI. Yeah, you get a PRI and Why have 24 you channels of fun. 23, 23. 20, 23 plus 1D for 64K D channel. Um, though, you know, if you're trying to mess with the D channel. Um, and the, BR, the PRI has a lot more um, Q931 messages that are actually supported. Yeah. So. But in terms of hacking it, other than please don't. Yeah, it does knock it off. Um, Behave. Um, well, there's actually there's a lot of abuse as it is. There was a recent bug that that came up, or, or Paul had discovered with Supera phones that that people were messing with the D channel in terms of how they were starting billing. There's a thing called early audio, where you can play audio before the call is technically terminated because it saves you a couple seconds on billing. Right. Um, this tends to screw up other devices that are expecting to see call completion. If they don't see it in a certain amount of time, they drop the call. Right, and it, they don't pass audio until they see a call completion. But you know, say for Northwest Airlines, as an example, does this, they will send audio before they technically answer the call. And, and actually, in terms of, of BRI versus, versus internet termination, if your internet termination provider who's providing SIP trunking or, or asterisk trunking is any good, they're going to be filtering some of this stuff if they can. Um, from you preventing from you from from saying, hey, I'm coming from you know the White House or something like that. You know when you announce your number, um, it is a lot actually of fun for screwing with your friends though. It is, yeah, it is, yeah. You can do amazingly <laughs> fun things when you know when when calling your friends and whatnot. But they, if they're any good, they'll be filtering it. Your PRI provider, if they're any good, will also be doing the same thing, uh, or your BRI provider. This being said, if your BRI or PRI provider happens to be a ILEC, they're dumb. Um, <laughs> There was, and even as far back as, for example, I had a Sprint uh, TDM T1 back in 96-ish that you could announce any digits you wanted to. Uh, we didn't discover this until somebody said, do you realize that your phone switch is erroring out and sending 999-999-9999 to every call that goes out that thing? Wow, I didn't think it would let us do that. Because um, normally they'll mask that um, from numbers that they know it to be, or, or, or will sometimes even throw regis. I but had again. an SBC PRI where you could actually call from 69. Yeah, you don't have to announce much. When you see, when you see a lot of the stuff calling in from on, on the caller ID digits, it's actually a separate data stream. Um, and if they've got you both as a trunk group anyway, it doesn't matter what number you're. You can be trunk group 100 with them and sending out 69. They still know who you are. Yeah, they'll know who you are for billing, but uh, you can really jam caller ID that way. Yeah, and the yeah, other thing, know, when, it, when we come into things like caller ID and being able to specify arbitrary things, it's important to describe how caller ID with name actually works. A lot of people think, oh, well, I can just send facilities IE with whatever name I want. Ha, ha, ha. It doesn't work that way. Um, what happens is, is that there's a database lookup that occurs on the recipient's end if they subscribe to the service. And um, they translate the number you sent to a name based on the caller ID with name database that they're using. And there's actually a couple, and there are some conflicts between them, which will cause sometimes really amusing trouble tickets. Like, hey, when I call my friend, it comes up as like Joe's Pizza. But uh, you know, I call my mom, and it says, you know, Tim and Paul. What's going on? Well, there's two different databases, and one of them's using one, and one of them's using the other, and one of them's obviously wrong. Um, but uh, you know, I've I've had a lot of questions like, hey, I want to change the number that comes up or the name that comes up. And like, can I just do this with my PRI? No, you really can't. Yeah. You have to call your phone company who submits a change to the caller ID with name database. The other, because the other thing that's tied is, is the E911 stuff tied to the same changes? No, that's the no. AOI. That is the AOI? Okay. Usually it's on the same form when you set up the caller ID with name on my end. You see the same form, but there, it's actually a database. It's the SS7 IN group. Okay. CNM, or 911's like a separate group with no sense of humor. I think they're, they were in Ohio last I checked. Okay. Right, and one thing that I want to quick add uh, about spoofing caller ID essentially is about many phone companies being dumb. Um, in Pennsylvania, one thing that I know is that Verizon is really dumb. I have That's called. That's pretty universal. That's yeah, universal. yeah, actually, yeah. <laughs> Um, I call my house regularly as 666. Why? Because I can. However, uh, my experience has been with the C-Lec that I have at home, um, I have one of those Flex T1 PRI voice and data all 
burstable, happy, fun stuff things. Um, and a lot of times, and this is how it's been explained to me, Paul clarify if he could, um, that if I try sending an in a number outside my DID block, it actually messes with E911. Yes, often what happens is, is that the number you send is what's transmitted to the caller or 911 database. And how 911 works is that basically the phone switch looks at your, looks at your caller ID and determines this is 248 so and so, so and so. It goes and does a lookup into the E911 database where they have your street address and it tells them, all right, this number is this street address and it's supposed to be routed to this E911 call center. So then it takes that information and routes it to that call center. Well, if you send the wrong number, you'll get the wrong data from that database back, and it will send it to the wrong call center if it's even possible to do so. Now, if you're sending something from a completely different state, um, they probably don't have any interconnection at all, and your call will fail. Or it will be defaulted to something in your region. Well, and this is also important because if you have one of those 911 hang up calls, they, most, uh, most lo uh, police localities, they have to dispatch to whatever the address that they get is. That's why they were so big on, you know, putting uh, GPS and, and location-based services on phones for on cell phones for 911 calls. Um, if you're sending the wrong digits in your area and it's to the wrong location, and somebody, you know, the theoretical heart attack hang-up call, um, they'll go to that address if it's the wrong address based on the number. Right. Um, and which is why it's like it's one of those just like you can have a lot of fun with it, but please don't. It, 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 I've seen a lot of things go very, very badly. Now. Yeah, and not to mention, as as the phone company, they get they get what's called a record not found if they if you give a number that hasn't been loaded into the database, and that's where the where the uh, PSAP says, hey, look, when the customer called, there was no address information, and um, you need to fix that within you know 48 hours or something, mm -hmm. and so that invokes like a whole another set of rules that you're just making a more headache for your phone company and they're far more likely to go like, you know what, this jerk's given me like seven record not, record not found in the last week. He's got a trouble ticket. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to fix this other guy's circuit first. Or cut you off completely. Right. And, that's, and if you read your contracts, a lot of them have an escape clause that says, you know, if you're breaking the phone network, we will shut you off. And that's based in, I believe, um, like 43 CFR 62 in the FCC rules. So even if it doesn't say it in your contract, we have the legal right to shut your circuit off if you're hurting the phone network. Yeah. And it's very nonspecific as to what, what hurting is. Mm -hmm. There's a gentleman and a question in the back. Yeah, I just want to bring up, there's sides to the light of. <coughs> I just want to say that there's sites that allow you to do uh, caller ID spoofing, like spoofcard.com. And if you come from a foreign carrier, like an international uh, SIP provider, you can still shoot your own caller ID to most, most switches and lacks. But yeah, it does screw things up for them. Yeah, and then and, and again, they're, they're deliberately doing that. Yeah. Um, that's, their, that's their whole point, is that they've, they've got it set up so they can just fake out whatever, um, which is useful for calling internationally, <laughs> because sometimes there's really nasty ways and why a lot of um, uh, third world and other countries uh, that they're, they've got corrupt ILX even worse than ours, don't want you doing SIP because they basically are, are screwing their population who actually heck and have telephones um, to, to do that. And I think we've got time for just one more here. That's what I'm thinking. 10 more? Five. Uh, another radio station question. If I got a PRI to a known choke switch, would I have a better chance at winning radio contests? <laughs> Go Only off. if you know the phrase that pays. Only if you know the phrase that pays. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck getting it. Um, unless you're a radio station, I can't see how you get it ordered. He could probably order Yeah, I mean, we can do retarded things, but <laughs> it doesn't mean we're going to. Um, what it comes down to is a lot of these switches, they don't even support PRI. They pick the stuff that's just going to fall right over because that's what it's supposed to do. You know, stuff, stuff that does not scale. Right. It's or the stuff that you know they'll like go. Well, this is like a gigantic five ESS. We're not going to pull any T ones off of it just because we primarily use it for the choke tandem. Um, a lot of the switching is, uh, frankly, and in fact is if it's not your local switch switching office, 
you're going to have problems anyway. You'd end up spending, even if you could theoretically do it, in order to get something routed from there to the choke switch, which is, if, in a, if, for example, if you were in Troy, Michigan, choke switch, I believe, is down in Detroit, uh, Detroit, Madison. Um, yeah. Which, if you were to have a line pulled to that, uh, the special access charges and whatnot, you might as well just go invest that. You'll make about as much money as you would attempting to win this contest because it's still not going to be guaranteed. Just go board. buy the Ferrari in cash. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. By the time you got done spending money and figuring out how to do this, you could have gone and made m money doing other things. Plus, if you've gone and figured this out, you should be making money doing telecom consulting. Um, and then you can go <laughs> buy the Ferrari. Yeah, really. There's a lot of money to be made if you know. So. We're out of time, guys. All right. All right. Okay. Well, thanks for being thanks a good audience. Thank you much. And um, we're probably going to go up to somewhere around the con suite. So, this. if you have any other questions, we'll address them as long as they're legal. I've had enough government trouble as is. If and some of us wish year. to avoid it. Yeah. <laughs>